Section 7a of the History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, The Union and National Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Nowak. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, Section 7a. Chapter 7 the formation of the constitution the promise and the difficulties of america the rise of a young republic composed of thirteen states each governed by officials popularly elected under constitutions drafted by the plain people was the most significant feature of the eighteenth century the majority of the patriots whose labors and sacrifices had made this possible naturally looked upon their work and pronounced it good those Americans, however, who peered beneath the surface of things, saw that the Declaration of Independence, even if splendidly phrased, and paper constitutions drawn by finest enthusiasm uninstructed by experience, could not alone make the Republic great and prosperous, or even free. All around them they saw chaos in finance and in industry, and perils for the immediate future. The government under the Articles of Confederation had neither the strength nor the resources necessary to cope with the problems of reconstruction left by the war. The sole organ of government was a Congress composed of from two to seven members from each state chosen as the legislature might direct and paid by the state. In determining all questions, each state had one vote. Delaware thus enjoyed the same weight as Virginia. There was no president to enforce the laws. The Congress was given power to select a committee of thirteen, one from each state, to act as an executive body when it was not in session, but this device, on being tried out, proved a failure. There was no system of national courts to which citizens and states could appeal for the protection of their rights or through which they could compel obedience to law. The two great powers of government, military and financial, were withheld. Congress, it is true, could authorize expenditures, but had to rely upon the states for the payment of contributions to meet its bills. It could also order the establishment of an army, but it could only request the states to supply their respective quotas of soldiers. It could not lay taxes, nor bring any pressure to bear upon a single citizen in the whole country. It could act only through the medium of the state governments. Financial and Commercial Disorders in the field of public finance the disorders were pronounced the huge debt incurred during the war was still outstanding congress was unable to pay either the interest or the principal public creditors were in despair as the market value of their bonds sank to twenty-five or even ten cents on the dollar the current bills of congress were unpaid as someone complained there was not enough money in the treasury to buy pen and ink with which to record the transactions of the shadow legislature the currency was in utter chaos Millions of dollars in notes issued by Congress had become mere trash worth a cent or two on the dollar. There was no other expression of contempt so forceful as the popular saying, not worth a continental. To make matters worse, several of the states were pouring new streams of paper money from the press. Almost the only good money in circulation consisted of English, French, and Spanish coins, and the public was even defrauded by them because money changers were busy clipping and filing away the metal foreign commerce was unsettled the entire british system of trade discrimination was turned against the americans and congress having no power to regulate foreign commerce was unable to retaliate or to negotiate treaties which it could enforce domestic commerce was impeded by the jealousies of the states which erected tariff barriers against their neighbors the condition of the currency made the exchange of money and goods extremely difficult and as if to increase the confusion backward states enacted laws hindering the prompt collection of debts within their borders an evil which nothing but a national system of courts could cure congress in disrepute with treaties set at naught by the states the laws unenforced the treasury empty and the public credit gone the congress of the united states fell into utter disrepute it called upon the states to pay their quotas of money into the treasury only to be treated with contempt even its own members looked upon it as a solemn futility some of the ablest men refused to accept election to it and many who did take the doubtful honor failed to attend the sessions again and again it was impossible to secure a quorum for the transaction of business troubles of the state governments the state governments free to pursue their own course with no interference from without had almost as many difficulties as the congress 
They were too loaded with revolutionary debts calling for heavy taxes upon an already restive population, oppressed by their financial burdens, and discouraged by the fall in prices which followed the return of peace. The farmers of several states joined in a concerted effort and compelled their legislatures to issue large sums of paper money. The currency fell in value, but nevertheless it was forced on unwilling creditors to square old accounts. In every part of the country, legislative action fluctuated violently. Laws were made one year only to be repealed the next and reenacted the third year. Lands were sold by one legislature, and the sales were cancelled by its successor. Uncertainty and distrust were the natural consequences. Men of substance longed for some power that would forbid states to issue bills of credit, to make paper money legal tender in payment of debts, or to impair the obligation of contracts. Men heavily in debt, on the other hand, urged even more drastic action against creditors. So great did the discontent of the farmers in New Hampshire become in 1786 that a mob surrounded the legislature, demanding a repeal of the taxes and the issuance of paper money. It was with difficulty that an armed rebellion was avoided. In Massachusetts, the malcontents, under the leadership of Daniel Shays, a captain in the Revolutionary Army, organized that same year open resistance to the government of the state. Shays and his followers protested against the conduct of creditors in foreclosing mortgages upon the debt-burdened farmers, against the lawyers for increasing the cost of legal proceedings, against the Senate of the state, the members of which were apportioned among the towns on the basis of the amount of taxes paid, against heavy taxes, and against the refusal of the legislature to issue paper money. They seized the town of Worcester and Springfield and broke up the courts of justice. All through the western part of the state the revolt spread, sending a shock of alarm to every center and section of the young republic. Only by the most vigorous action was Governor Bowdoin able to quell the uprising, and when that task was accomplished, the state government did not dare to execute any of the prisoners, because they had so many sympathizers. Moreover, Bowdoin and several members of the legislature, who had been most zealous in their attacks on the insurgents, were defeated at the ensuing election. The need of national assistance for state governments in times of domestic violence was everywhere emphasized by men who were opposed to revolutionary acts. Alarm over dangers to the Republic Leading American citizens, watching the drift of affairs, were slowly driven to the conclusion that the new ship of state, so proudly launched a few years before, was careening into anarchy. The facts of our peace and independence, wrote a friend of Washington, do not at present wear so promising an appearance as I had fondly painted in my mind. The prejudices, jealousies, and turbulence of the people at times almost stagger my confidence in our political establishments and almost occasion me to think that they will show themselves unworthy of the noble prize for which we have contended. Washington himself was profoundly discouraged. On hearing of Shay's rebellion, he exclaimed, What, gracious God, is man that there should be such inconsistency and perfidiousness in his conduct? It is but the other day that we were shedding our blood to obtain the constitutions under which we now live, constitutions of our own choice and making, and now we are unsheathing our sword to overturn them. The same year he burst out in a lament over the rumors of restoring royal government. I am told that even respectable characters speak of a monarchical government without horror, from thinking proceeds speaking, hence to acting is often but a single step. But how irresistible and tremendous! What a triumph for our enemies to verify their predictions! What a triumph for the advocates of despotism to find that we are incapable of governing ourselves! Congress Attempts Some Reforms the Congress was not indifferent to the events that disturbed Washington. On the contrary, it put forth many efforts to check tendencies so dangerous to finance, commerce, industries, and the Confederation itself. In 1781, even before the Treaty of Peace was signed, the Congress, having found out how futile were its taxing powers, carried a resolution of amendment to the Articles of Confederation, authorizing the levy of a moderate duty on imports. Yet this mild measure was rejected by the states. Two years later, the Congress prepared another amendment sanctioning the levy of duties on imports, to be collected this time by state officers and applied to the payment of the public debt. This more limited proposal, designed to save public credit, likewise failed. In 1786, the Congress made a third appeal to the states for help, declaring that they had been so irregular and so negligent in paying their quotas that further reliance upon that mode of raising revenues was dishonorable and dangerous. The calling of a constitutional convention. Hamilton and Washington urge reform. 
the attempts at reform by the congress were accompanied by demand for both within and without that body a convention to frame a new plan of government in seventeen eighty the youthful alexander hamilton realizing the weakness of the articles so widely discussed proposed a general convention for the purpose of drafting a new constitution on entirely different principles with tireless energy he strove to bring his countrymen to his view washington agreeing with him on every point declared in a circular letter to the governors that the duration of the union would be short unless there was lodged somewhere a supreme power to regulate and govern the general concerns of the confederated republic the governor of massachusetts disturbed by the growth of discontent all about him suggested to the state legislature in seventeen eighty five the advisability of a national convention to enlarge the powers of congress the legislature approved the plan but did not press it to a conclusion the annapolis convention action finally came from the south the virginia legislature taking things into its own hands called a conference of delegates at annapolis to consider matters of taxation and commerce when the convention assembled in seventeen eighty six it was found that only five states had taken the trouble to send representatives the leaders were deeply discouraged but the resourceful hamilton a delegate from new york turned the affair to good account he secured the adoption of a resolution calling upon the congress itself to summon another convention to meet at philadelphia a national convention called seventeen eighty seven the congress as tardy as ever at last decided in february seventeen eighty seven to issue the call fearing drastic changes however it restricted the convention to the sole and express purpose of revising the articles of confederation jealous of its own powers it added that any alterations proposed should be referred to the congress and the states for their approval every state in the union except rhode island responded to this call indeed some of the states having the annapolis resolution before them had already anticipated the congress by selecting delegates before the formal summons came thus by the persistence of governors legislatures and private citizens there was brought about the long-desired national convention in may seventeen eighty seven it assembled in philadelphia the eminent men of the convention on the roll of that memorable convention were fifty-five men at least half of whom were acknowledged to be among the foremost statesmen and thinkers in america every field of statecraft was represented by them war and practical management in washington who was chosen president of the convention diplomacy in franklin now old and full of honor in his own land as well as abroad finance in alexander hamilton and robert morris law in james wilson of pennsylvania the philosophy of government in james madison called the father of the constitution they were not theorists but practical men rich in political experience and endowed with deep insight into the springs of human action three of them had served in the stamp act congress dickinson of delaware william samuel johnson of connecticut and john rutledge of south carolina eight had been signers of the declaration of independence reed of delaware sherman of connecticut wythe of virginia jerry of massachusetts franklin robert morris george clymer and james wilson of pennsylvania all but twelve had at some time served in the continental congress and eighteen were members of that body in the spring of seventeen eighty seven washington hamilton mifflin and charles pinckney had been officers in the revolutionary army seven of the delegates had gained political experience as governors of states the convention as a whole according to historian hildreth represented in a marked manner the talent intelligence and especially the conservative sentiment of the country end of section seven a